Today, we'll be creating this particular sci-fi orb that can be depicted as a number of things. But for now, let's leave the creativity up to you and start off with the tutorial. In our default scene, we're going to go ahead and press X and delete our default cube. We're going to press Shift A, Mesh, and add in a UV sphere. Now, we want the UV sphere to be subdivided, so we're going to press Control 2 to add in a subdivision surface of level 2. And we're going to go ahead to the Object button up here and press Shade Smooth. Now, we need a little bit of thickness to the glass, so we're going to go to the Modifier's Properties over here and add in a Solidify modifier. But we won't be able to see how solid it is. So we're going to press this button up here to toggle X-ray so that we can see how thick it's becoming. Now we want it to be a little thick. So let's just drag this button in in the solidify modifier till you get a thickness that you want. So I think I'm going to go with 0.055 as my thickness. And remember, I haven't scaled it up or anything. I'm just going ahead with the initial size that they've given. Now the next thing is you can go to your physics properties and make this a collision object so that no particle actually exits out of this particular boundary. To make sure that nothing exits out of the boundary, we can increase the damping to one and you could kill particles completely, but I don't want to kill particles. I just want them to stick at the edge if they are there at the edge. I'm also going to increase the friction to one and I'm going to randomize both of them to 0.5. So we have the damping and friction at one and the randomized values to 0.5. Now that this is a collision object, we can actually add in a particle emitter. So for that, we're going to press shift A and add in another UV sphere. And this time we're just going to scale it down till it's slightly smaller than the original sphere that we have. So this is approximately all right. Now we can go to the particle properties over here and add in a new particle system. Now we want this to perfectly loop. So we need to set all of the animation defaults and everything as well. So we want the end frame to be 300 so that it's a 10 second long animation. And to make it loop, we are going to need two particle systems. We'll set all of the settings to the first one and then duplicate it for the second one. So I want the number to be fairly high. So I'm going to go with something like 20,000. I'm going to make the frame start 150 frames before the original. So it's going to start at frame minus 150. Along with that, the end frame is going to be 150 frames before the ending. So that's 300 is the length. So it has to be 150. And I'm going to increase the lifetime to 100. Once I'm happy with that, I'm going to go down to the velocity and change from one meter per second such that it's going out to minus one so that it goes inward. But it doesn't have to be minus one also. I'm just going to go with minus 0 0.1 meter per second. After that, down under the field weights, I don't want it to react with gravity and fall down. So I'm just going to bring that down to zero. Once gravity is also down to zero, it'll actually play all right. However, I don't think I can just play the animation right now because I'm also recording and my laptop doesn't have that much RAM. So we can assume that we're happy with these settings and add in a new particle system by pressing this plus button. Now with the second particle system, we're going to go down here and select the original particle settings itself and then click this particular button to duplicate it. So it becomes its own user. Now we can make changes and the only changes that we should be doing is the frame start and frame end. So this one is going to have to start at frame 150 and end 150 frames after the last frame, which is going to be frame 450. With that, you should get a perfectly looping particle system. Now we can go down to the viewport display and switch off show emitter and also go to the render and switch off show emitter. And we'll do that for the other particle system as well. We should have done this before duplicating the particle system, but it looks like it already gets dechecked by itself. Now let's render as an object and we have to actually create an object that it's going to be rendered as. So let's press shift A and search for an icosphere. And before we do anything, we'll go to the drop down over here and change the subdivisions to one so that it's lighter for our laptop to process. Once you're happy with that, just grab it on the X and move it aside because we don't want it to actually be C. And then you can go back to your particle emitter, which is sphere 001. We can actually change this to emitter and we can actually change the name of the sphere to glass orb. And now with the emitter selected, we can go down and for the object, we can search for the icosphere and we can do that for both the particle systems. Render as object and instance object is going to be the icosphere. Sphere. Now clearly the icosphere is way too large so we're going to go ahead and decrease the size. So the scale instead of 0.5 will make it 0.1 and we're going to increase the scale randomness as well to something like 0.2 just so that we have a few particles that are slightly bigger maybe 0.5 and because of that I'll also change the actual scale down to 0.008. So I'm going to have to use these exact settings in the second particle system as well. So let's go down here, change the actual scale to 0.008 and scale randomness to 0.5. So that's perfectly all right. Now we could bake just to make sure I would 
suggest that you go all the way to cache over here for your cache settings and just bake all of these particle systems to make sure that it's looping. In case it's not looping, make changes accordingly to fix it. You have to make sure that the frame start is exactly the same number of frames before the end that the first particle system starts before the original start of the animation. And it should end the same number of frames after the end that the first one actually ends at as well. Along with that, you have to make sure that the lifetime is short enough such that after the first animation ends or the first simulation ends, so in my case, it ends at 150, the lifetime is 100, so it will end at 250. The last particle will die off at frame 250. So the end frame has to be after that. So you have to make all of those checks and it should be perfectly looping in that scenario. Another thing that makes things harder is if you actually switch on the velocity randomness. If you randomize the velocity, often that causes issues. So try to keep the randomness of the velocity and the Brownian motion and things like that to zero. You could randomize the velocity. It shouldn't cause too much issues with the looping, but Brownian forces generally does. So those tiny motions prevents it from looping. So just keep these at zero. We'll be using different force fields anyway. So with that, your particle system should be looping. So you could bake it just to check. But after you're done checking, delete all bakes for both the particle systems. You have to delete the bakes because if a bake is present, it won't react to any new force fields that we're adding in. So let's press Shift A and search for a force field. And we're going to search for a force itself initially. And immediately you see the particles just blow out. So we're going to have to go to the physics property and reduce the strength from one to minus one so that it becomes an attractive force. Along with that, I'm going to increase the flow to one as well. And I'm going to change the seed to 150. And I'm going to leave that as my first force field. And I'm going to add in a few more force fields. So ideally, you can check after every single force field that you add in how it's reacting and what changes you want. Bake it and then delete the bakes. I'm not going to do that for time's sake because I already have something perfectly set that I like. The next is going to be a vortex, which is going to help rotate these particles. They're all going to revolve. So I'm just going to rotate the vortex on the Y axis or view, doesn't matter, just a little bit like this. And for the vortex, again, I want it to actually flow towards the center. So I'm going to have an inflow of 0.5 and I'm going to change the seed to something random like 50. And the last thing that we want is some turbulence. So we're going to press shift A, force field, turbulence. And this just gives it that Brownian motion that we actually wanted. So again, for this, I'm going to increase the flow to something like 10. And with all of those settings set, I'm going to select my emitter object again, go to the particle settings, select the initial particle system and just go down under the cache. I'm going to bake it and I'm going to do the same thing for the second particle system as well. So I've baked in the animation and I've also added in a magnetic force field. I don't think it's making much of a difference, but the settings in case you do want it, I've just increased the strength to two and a flow of 10. That's about it. Once you're done with this, the next thing that you would want to do is actually see the speed at which it's actually moving because right now the frames are going to drop the frame rate is going to drop down really low i'm going to change the playback from play every frame to frame dropping and that way we can see a realistic speed at which it's animating but again we have to set the actual animation speed so let's go to our output properties and just set everything at once so the frame rate is going to be 30 frames per second and the output folder is wherever you want it to be file format is ffmpeg video and coding is going to be changed to mpeg4 with an output quality perceptually lossless now in our render property we're going to switch on ambient occlusion, bloom, screen space reflections, and underneath that, we're going to expand it and switch on refraction. With that, we can start our actual texturing. So let's bring our timeline back down, go to the junction, click and drag to the left to open a new window, and we're going to change this to the shader editor. We're going to press N to remove this, and up here, we're going to go ahead and switch off transparency and switch on rendered view and switch off overlays. Once we're happy with this, let's select our glass orb and give it its glass material. So let's go to the materials down here, add in a new material and the way we're going to create the glass is we're going to delete the default cube material, the principal PSDF, and search for a glass shader as well as a transparent shader. And that's because we actually want all the particles to be seen. And in EV, you can't quite see anything inside the glass. There's going to be far too much of refraction unless it's perfectly zero and it becomes completely transparent anyway. If the index of refraction is exactly one, it becomes transparent anyway. So we don't want that. We want the edges to actually have some refraction, but the middle to be become transparent. So we're going to search for a mixed shader and we're going to plug the glass in and the transparent in. We might switch this up later on. We're not completely sure as to which one should go up. But now we can control shift click this with the node wrangler switched on to just plug that up. 
or you could plug it in manually. But we see what the glass shader currently looks like. And we see this tiny reflection because the roughness is very low. So we're going to set the roughness to something like 0.2. And immediately we can see a little bit more of the glass over here. So the reason why we can't see any of the particles is because our glass material is still set to opaque. We have to go to the settings in the material properties over here, change this to alpha blend, and we're going to switch off show back face. And we're going to switch on screen space refractions. That way we can actually see all of the particles. And you can see how there's so much of refraction happening and there's doubles of every single particle that there is. And that's exactly why we want this transparent shader. And this is with 50% transparency. If we switch off transparency completely, this is the amount of refraction that's happening even in the center. And I don't want it to be like that. And that's why the factor is going to be taken care of using a layer weight node. And we're going to plug the facing into a color ramp. So let's search for a color ramp. And this is just for finer control. Place the facing into the factor and the color into the factor of the mix shader. Now we can press control shift click on the color ramp to see how much of it is actually black and how much of it is white. We clearly want more of it to be black. So I'm going to do that by reducing the blend down to something like 0 0.05. And I'm just going to bring this slider in as well, just a little bit. So something like that should be all right. Now, if I control shift click the mixed shader, we see that we get the glass in the center and the transparent below. So I am going to switch it, bring the glass down, bring the transparent up and switch the shaders. So now the edges are glass and the middle is the transparent BSDF. So I can just play around with the blend values till I get a little bit of refraction happening at the end. So I think a blend value of 0.1 is all right for now. The next thing is the glass. I actually wanted to have a teensy bit of blue. I'm just going to give it a hue of 0.5 and a saturation of 0.66. And that becomes our glasses edge. And the next thing that we can do is start off with the materials for our particles. So let's select the icosphere, give it a new material, and we're going to delete the principal BSDF and search for an emission shader. We're going to plug that into the surface and we're going to change the color to, again, a desaturated blue and increase the strength to something like 10, maybe give it a saturation of 0.7. That seems all right. And I want the outer edges of this particular glass orb to be much darker. So we can actually go to the world and just reduce this world color over there as well to something fairly dark. And for the transparent BSDF, just to take care of a little bit of the bloom inside, just reducing that value of the color changes the amount of light that actually passes through. I'm just going to reduce that up very tiny bit. Similarly, the IOR, I don't want this much of refraction happening. I want there to be refraction, but not that much. So I'm actually going to make it really high. So I'll give it an IOR of something like 20. And that's my glass orb. Now we need some sort of a background. So let's press Shift A, Mesh, Plane. Let's grab it on the Z and bring it down and just scale it up. Switch on our overlays once again. Press Tab, go to the edge select over here. Select this edge, EZ. Bring it up, then select this edge over here. Press Control B, bring it in, and then use your scroll wheel to increase the number of bevels, and then click again. Tap to go back out. Object, shade smooth. Now you have to place your camera. So take the camera, press Alt G, Alt R, R X 90, and then just grab it on the Y to move it back. Then press zero, and this seems all right. Let's go to my camera settings, go to viewport display, passport out all the way to one, after which, I'm going to actually select the glass orb and switch off shadows because a glass orb should not have that much of a shadow. Similarly, I don't want the particles to have this many shadows. So go to the shadow mode and make it none. Now with the plane, I'm going to add in a new material and just drop down the roughness completely so that it's basically shiny. And I don't want this light to actually be reflected like this. So I'm going to go to my light. I'm actually going to increase the radius quite a bit and switch off specular completely. With that, I can press Alt G to clear the location of the light and then grab it on the Z and just move it up as well. And that seems all right. And I guess the last thing that you have to do before actually rendering this out is going to be switching on motion blur. So just check the motion blur. Make sure you change the shutter and test out a frame. So I'm going to keep the shutter at 0 0.8 and just render out a single image to see how much of motion blur is actually coming in. And based on that, once you're happy with it, you can go ahead and just render the animation. So this seems all right. There's actually not much motion blur. And I guess that's because the particles are moving too slowly. That's why I'm going to have to increase the shutter even more. And then I can go ahead and click on render animation. Just before rendering, a few more things that I did that I think you should know is that the icosphere color, instead of having a single color in the emission, I just added in a color ramp. 
that goes from like a bluish color to a pinkish color and i added a gradient texture with linear and i had to change the mapping coordinates accordingly so that it goes blue to green over here and it is connected up to the camera coordinates so that it doesn't depend on the individual objects and it just goes from the left to the right along with that the actual glass orb again for the glass i just changed it from a single color to a gradient texture and this one is just blue to pink as well for the actual background i did quite a bit I added in a noise texture, musgrave texture, and a wave texture, set them up like this. You can actually just see the values that I've used over here. The reason why I have the wave texture in the middle over here is just so that I could get the face offset to make it loop in some sort of a manner. And I plugged all of that into a bump node with a fairly low strength and plugged that into the normal. And I also just gave the same treatment of a gradient from blue to pink. And I've reduced the saturation over here and plugged that in as the base color. That gave this particular final effect and the animation that you saw at the beginning and you're going to see now at the end. Hopefully you learned something from this video. There are a lot of cool things that you can do with particle systems, but I think this is something that you can just start your journey off with. Play around with the settings to have a better understanding of how different force fields interact and use this to create something cool. Until the next video does come out, keep on creating and stay creative.